Titus ball if they can. They may be scarred from collisions with asteroids and things, but there's no tectonics because there's no way for a plate to move anywhere. See what I'm saying? Now, Earth has both those features. Why? Because the cracked backside of it allowed it to fold itself back over on itself and pull kind of back into a ball, but now it's missing a big chunk here, right? As it falls back over like that, so now you've got the missing crust area, and you've got the ability for what's left to move in the tectonic fashion. This would not have looked like it does today, but we know that it, you know, a couple of times at least, we've had all the land pulled together, and then it drifts around the surface. Plate tectonics, missing crust, plausibly answered by a new Elish written down 4,000 to 6,000 years ago. Now, the last great mystery we're gonna deal with is Pluto. Remember about nothing should be off the ecliptic? Well, Pluto is 17 degrees off the ecliptic and has an orbit unlike the other orbits of the planets. It comes inside the orbit of Neptune. So, something's wrong with Pluto, and now astronomers basically are in agreement that it must have started life as a moon of a larger outside planet. But they don't know which one, and they don't know how it could have been removed out to where it is. What they say in the New Middle is that Nibiru captured it away from Saturn on one of its trips out, pulled it out to where it is and dropped it off. So there are those five great mysteries plausibly answered by a story written by the Sumerians right out of the Stone Age four to six thousand years ago. Go figure. Okay, next slide. When the dust settled, here's what we had. We had the solar system as we have it today. And then we have Nibiru moving in an orbit like I saw, showed you earlier of 3,600 Earth years. So every orbit for them is 3,600, every year for them is 3,600 of our years. All right, now I say that the last time it was through was around 200 BC. I based that on, I believe that it caused or had a very strong hand in causing the end of the last ice age and the great flood. And I base my timing on uh, ice core samples and stuff. You will get different dates for that last time around. You will get a different date from this wonderful lady right here, Cynthia Turnage. She has a different, she sees it differently than I do. Zechariah Sitchin sees it a little differently than I do. But I go with the ice cores. I think the ice cores are going to prove out to be pretty accurate for now. So if I'm right, then it came around 200 BC, and if it's 3,600 years, it's not going to be around till 3400 it contain instructions to make proteins the building blocks of life. So we go, these are here, this is here, like that. You with me? You understand. Okay, now let's take a look at what genetic engineering is. Don't try to ask how it happens. This is what happens. They open a cell, they pull out strands of DNA like this, and 98% of this strand is going to be what's called junk DNA. We don't know what it does. But the 2% that works are called the working segments. The working segments. And the working segments make the proteins, which is the start of all life's processes. You with me? So what happens is if you can cut in the junk above and in the junk below, you can move out a working segment here, and you can bring in a working segment from anywhere else and make it work. This can be plant into animal, animal into plant, fish into fowl, it doesn't matter. Why? Because all living things at the most basic level are the same. We have the same four base pairs, the same 20 amino acids, we have the same genetic code. Understand that. It's just the rearrangement of the base pairs that makes the difference. But it, there's so much of it that is, it's so complex, there's so much possibility, that's why you get so many different species. We think we've had maybe a billion on the Earth in the, in the whole time that we've been here. But anyway, whether that's true or not, this is true. You have to cut above and below, but if you do it, it works, and this comes in here, and it starts expressing itself as it used to, and now it's mixing in with whatever else is there, and you get something new. But you can't predict. That's the thing about genetics, you can't predict. So we're afraid of our geneticists putting something in here and creating the Andromeda strain that will kill us all. What you have to do is you have to put it in, let it express itself, see what you get, and then do something else based on what that is. That's why we use fruit flies and things like that because they have a very quick turnover. But you can do it 
with more complex creatures if you have the time. I have a chapter in my book called Gorillas into Linebackers in which we say, well, what if we wanted to turn gorillas into football playing linebackers? What would we have to do? Could we do it? Yes, we could. If we just had the time to go through all the permutations that it would take to get what we want. Well, that's what the Anunnaki did with us. They worked it, and they worked it, and they worked it. They made a lot of mistakes. They talk about some of the mistakes, you know, creatures born with no organs, no sex organs, organs outside the bodies, horrible mistakes, until they got what they want, the smooth skin of the gods. They got it, eventually. It took a long time, but they got it. And that is how they created us. That is what they say. Now, let's start looking at some of the hardcore evidence that we are genetically engineered. Next slide, please. Okay, here we go. Cerebral cortex is the deeply convoluted surface region of the brain that is most strongly linked to intelligence. That is the darker part on the outside here. Now, if you peel that off of the brain of a rat, it will cover a postage stamp. If you do it, peel it off of a monkey, it will cover a postcard. A chimpanzee, our closest genetic relative, 99% the same, we're 99% chimpanzee, 99% gorilla, one sheet of typing paper. And yet here we go, do it to hours, and you've got four sheets of typing paper. Now isn't it clear that something really weird happened here? Not a transit, this is a transition. This is a transformation, it's clear. But not only that, here's the weirdness. These guys are using all of what they have. As far as we can tell, there's no region of theirs that doesn't work. But we, with our big four sheets, and our brain works differently too, we're only using about half of one sheet. That's it. The rest of it's lying fallow. We're only using about 10% of our brain. Everybody knows that. We know that from the feats of idiot savants. You saw Dustin Hoffman in Rain Man. You know the story. In the damage to the good 10%, somehow an idiot savant gets a ray into the 90%. And the ray may be here, it may be here, it may be in math, it may be in music. We don't know wherever it goes. We have enough of them to know we've got a huge portion of our brain we're not using. We've got like 10 to 100,000 miles of neural network and we're only using a few hundred to a few thousand. We don't really know, but we just know we're sealed off. Well, remember, smart but not too smart. What happened? Genetically sealed us off. They had to give us their brains. Remember, they were just transferring their bodies, putting a little of the creature of Earth in their bodies so we would be better adapted to the planet than they were, but basically we're them. So we got their brain, but they didn't want us to be as smart as them. You know what your slave is smart as you? So they sealed us off. They gave us enough to be good slaves, to speak, to think, to follow instructions, to do what they wanted us to do. And that's it, and no more. Science has absolutely, of course, no explanation for this, not even a guess. But I say what the Sumerians say makes some pretty good sense, doesn't it? Okay, next slide. Okay, you, some of you are going to remember the mitochondrial studies of uh, the late 1980s, but here we go. In humans, over 99.99% of the cell's DNA is packed into the cell nucleus with a small amount occurring outside the nucleus of small structures called mitochondria. Well, here we go. In the nucleus, 99.99 of the DNA, but out here, we have these little things floating free, and they're called organelles. And inside the organelles are mitochondrial DNA, about 16,000 base pairs each. And you can take these and study them and see the rate of mutation in the organelles. And it turns out that when we have a mating, this DNA changes. It's, it's mixed, but this passes down intact. So in females, it passes down from generation to generation to generation intact. So you can take the mitochondrial uh, DNA of any female in the world, any woman in this room, any female in this room, and you can tell when your oldest living ancestor was alive. You just track back on the mutations in your mitochondrial DNA. So when they found that they could do that in the late 1970s, they said, well, let's go do a bunch of women around the world and see if we separated from the primates closer to 8 million years or closer to 5 million years. You remember back that part where, that's where they thought they were sure that we had split because they had that nice series of skulls showing, you know, where bodies showing where we came from. Let's go see if it's closer to 8 million years or 5 million years. So they did the test of the mitochondrial DNA, women all over the world, every race, creed, color, country, and they came back and guess what they found? It wasn't close to 8 million years. It wasn't close 
to today million. It was only close to five million years. It was all the way down to 200 to 250,000 years ago. That's it. We don't exist, according to our genes, prior to 200 to 250,000 years ago at the outside. Now, how did that happen? When we're supposed to have come all the way from back here, four million years minimum and way beyond that, our genes should say that, shouldn't they? But they don't. Well, of course, the anthropologists who believe this and who promulgate this thought the biologists were crazy. You guys must be out of your minds. Can't be true. Can't possibly be true. And the biologists said, oh, yeah, we couldn't make that many mistakes. We'll do it again. And they have. They've done many tests since, and it always comes out the same, around 200,000, 250,000 years outside. That's it. We are new. We are brand new. Isn't that weird? Now, that was everywhere. Uh, that news went out everywhere. Uh, here we go with the cover of Newsweek 1987. What, what does this mean? Not only could they tell us how old we were 200, 250,000 years ago, they could tell us where the oldest of us came from by far, and guess where it was? What does this tell you? Southern Africa. The oldest of us came from Southern Africa, which means what? If there's an Adam and Eve, they're blind. And so, when Newsweek realized it had to put this on the cover, they made the blacks look as white as they could. This guy looks whiter than OJ, doesn't he? But, of course, needless to say, this ticked off everybody in the South just to have them on here, and it ticked off every black because they look so white. So Newsweek, in trying to have it both ways, caught it coming and going. But the truth is, and you should have seen the letters that came in after this, but nonetheless, they told the truth. The oldest of us come from Southern Africa 200 to 250,000 years ago. A complete and total shock to every scientist out there. But guess what? Four to 6,000 years ago, what did the Sumerians write? That the Anunnaki created us to be their slaves 200 to 250,000 years ago in Southern Africa to dig in their minds and do their work. And then later we spread up to the garden and became their servants. Exactly what the Sumerians were writing four to 6,000 years ago, our scientists proved against their will and against their best estimations that the Sumerians were right. I think that's pretty compelling. Next slide, please. Okay, here we go. We're near the end, kids. We're in the home stretch. Okay, when something is born in the wild and dies, what happens to it if it's really screwed up? Born in the wild and, excuse me, I'm sorry, born in the wild and it's really screwed up, what happens to it? It dies. It's not allowed to reach maturity. The parents will kill it if they have to. Something really screwed up. Am I right? Everybody knows that's true. You're looking at the exception right here. Humans. Humans. You're looking at 26 of our worst genetic defects and where they're found on our chromosomes. But guess what? How many do you think we have total? 4,000 and counting. 4,000 and counting. We don't know how many actually we have. Now, how does a creature 200 to 250,000 years old genetically develop even one genetic defect that spreads through the entire gene pool, much less 4,000? We're not talking now a sperm egg misconnect, like a two-headed snake or a six-legged lamb. We're talking something that repeats generation after generation after generation that will produce the same disorder. That's a genetic defect. How do we get that? Not naturally, of course, right? How do we get it? Cutting and splicing. Cutting and splicing genetically. Guess what? When you cut and splice genetically, you make mistakes. Why do you make mistakes? Because remember the cutting and the splicing that we were talking about? It's not done with blades. It's done with chemicals. Chemicals. And chemicals don't cut that precisely. You can get little spills or little touches where they don't belong. You get mistakes. And so the Anunnaki would make mistakes, 4,000 plus. But did they have to worry about those mistakes? No, they're making a slave. What does it matter to them? They're making a slave. Do they care if one in 100 is screwed up? They do not. Do they care if one in 10 is screwed up? They do not. They don't care. But more importantly, they know the mathematics of the deal. If you have something with 4,000 disorders and you let the gene pool spread out naturally, they're not all going to have the 4,000. As we sit here in this room today, we average 50 of those 4,000 apiece, 50. 
you know, you might have 200, I might have 10, the average is 50. So when we